Good evening, church family. This is uh, Wednesday, April the 15th, and we are midweek post-Easter celebration where we were not able to be uh, together as a church family. Again, we are looking forward to when we can meet together, all of us worshiping the Lord together, but we certainly hope and trust that uh, you are able to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, either uh, yourself or your family, and just meditate on who Christ is and what he's done. And uh, to start out our devotional time tonight, uh, I want to ask Pastor Tim a question and uh, along the lines of uh, really some post-Easter discussion here. Um, we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest teacher who's ever lived, setting for us an example of uh, moral authority and uh, excellent example in life of someone to imitate. So why does it really matter that Jesus rose from the dead? I mean, if there was no resurrection, wouldn't we still be right to follow Christ? And wouldn't Christianity still be the greatest of all religions? How much of a difference does the resurrection actually make? So glad you asked, Pastor Jeff. <laughs> let's, um, let's read some verses. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is where we're going to get our answer in our okay. devotional for today. 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to read verses 12 through 19. Paul says, Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Some really wonderful things to unpack there. And I guess we could start off by saying, if you remove the resurrection from the gospel message, mm -hmm. you lose everything. And, uh, you know, we can get into the spe uh, specifics of why that is, right. but that's going to be our, our kind of our foundation here. The resurrection, if that's taken out, everything else falls apart in, in the Christian faith. I think it was Rob Bell years ago uh, talked about if what, what would you do as a Christian if they somehow found Jesus's skeleton in a tomb somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, that he didn't rise again. And Rob Bell, who I think has gone completely off the rails and he's not a, a good uh, a reliable source of, of instruction. Um, he tried to argue that you could still have a, a, a good religion. Right. You know, Jesus didn't rise, but Christianity is still a good religion that you should follow. And I, I say that's completely bogus. That makes absolutely no sense biblically. If Jesus didn't rise, this is how Paul thinks, and this is what Paul says. If Jesus didn't come out of that tomb, then I, what are some of the words he uses here? Look in verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. I'm sorry. And then uh, verse 14, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yeah. So for Paul, it's, it's everything. It's the heart of the gospel. And that verse supposes or presupposes that what we're preaching and what we're believing is the resurrected Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. So if there's no resurrection, then this, this faith that we all have committed ourselves to and this Gospel message that we preach, it's uh, bankrupt. I, I wonder what the Greek yeah. word there is. I didn't look it up before we started, but mm -hmm. that word empty, yeah. it's bare. There's nothing there. It's, yeah. it's not that it's diminished. It's not lesser. Uh, it's, it's nothing, right? Yeah. yeah. That's what we're seeing here in these verses. Think of what that means. Uh, your faith is empty. How many millions upon millions of people have believed in Christ? Mm -hmm. Saying that's empty. You're preaching. Our preaching is empty. Think about the millions of messages that have been preached since uh, Christ first rose from the dead. He rose from the dead, which we believe, of course, that he did raise from the dead. He's saying all that's empty if there's no resurrection. Notice he, he starts with the, um, someone just made a statement, verse 12. Right. Some say there's no resurrection. Well, who's that? Well, we don't know. But apparently in the church at Corinth, among all the other problems they were having, was a few going, somebody's saying there's no resurrection. 
Paul's saying, if there is no such thing generally as a resurrection, like there's no way there can be a resurrection from the dead. And do you remember that this was something that, that we've looked at in the Gospels before between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? Say that, Sadducees yeah. say there is no resurrection. So he says, there's people like that who say that. Modern man, how could we believe in a resurrection? The Apostle Paul, during some of his preaching, you know, when he gets to the resurrection, people are like, all right, that's enough. But he just, he just makes this very basic point first in verse 13. If there's no resurrection of the dead, generally speaking, then Christ has arisen from the dead. Absolutely. So then he, then he gets into, and so, right, you're, you're preaching, our preaching is empty, your faith is empty. How about verse 15? He says, yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified that God has raised up Christ, whom, in fact, he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. Who, who's, who's testifying that Jesus is risen? Well, we should be in, yeah. our, in our preaching yeah. Yeah. because we're following in the doctrines and the teachings and the traditions of the apostles. Right. This is what they said. Yeah. We just listened to a message this morning about preaching Christ crucified. Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you. Yeah. And he talks about the crucified and the risen Savior. And if you think about those different groups, so you mentioned the Sadducees and the mm -hmm. Pharisees, and one of their main arguments was whether or not there is such a thing as, a, as the resurrection of the dead. The Old Testament has it. Yeah. Right? We have this phrase you see in the Old Testament about Abraham died and was gathered to his fathers. Mm. That's, that's um, implying an existence and a consciousness mm. with others after experiencing death. Yeah. You have the, the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. You have David saying about his son, I won't go to him, or he won't come to me, but I will go to him. Job has confidence Job. he's going to see his redeemer. He's yeah. going to see him. You're this isn't some him. new concept that's introduced in the New Testament. Right. This is from Genesis to Revelation. This right. is what God has, has shown us in his word, right. that this life is not final. This is not the end of our, our right. existence and our consciousness and, and our life, yeah. right? And, and Paul has already, Paul began this chapter, which is all about the resurrection. So read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But he began this chapter by laying out, this is the gospel, yeah. right? It's very simply, you know, Christ was crucified according to scriptures. He was buried. He rose again according to scriptures and was seen. Then he goes to say, he was seen by, and he starts to, to spell out. He, he specifies some names, yeah. people that have seen um, the Lord. And then he gives the 500 brethren at once. So he, he has a point when he begins this to say to probably skeptics that exist in all ages, yeah. hey, there are really eyewitnesses to this event. <laughs> You know, uh, unlike uh, other religious systems where n nobody saw the kind of visions that, uh, we'll say, Muhammad had. Nobody, nobody saw the tablets that Joseph Smith said that he saw. Nobody saw. He's saying this. Jesus' acts were, were, um, were attested to, including his resurrection. Yeah. I think there's a phrase in the book of Acts, these things weren't done in a corner. Right. <laughs> This right. was some little secret group of people in this yeah. small remote area. These were public things. And also, that's one of the qualifications, as I understand it, for apostleship. Right. So when, when Paul comes in uh, Corinth and he's preaching the gospel and someone says, why should we believe you? Why, why should we listen to what you're saying? He, his answer is, I have spent time with the resurrected Lord Jesus. Mm. That was one of his qualifications. Right. Why, sh why should we hear you out? Why should you come in and teach us you know, this, this doctrine? And Paul's answer is, I met him on the road to Damascus. I yeah. saw him. I, I talked to him yeah. post-crucifixion. Right. And so what the person in Corinth has to say now is, Paul, you're lying. Right. You're lying. You're a false witness of God. He says, we're false witnesses of God, meaning what we've been testifying to about God's power and raising his son from the dead is all wrong. Yeah. We're, we're false. We can't be trusted. All the apostles, all those 500 uh, brethren at once, certainly the women who testified to Jesus' um, resurrection. He says, all of them then have to be called uh, liars. And then you start asking questions like, well, would a liar be willing to suffer what they suffered? Not just one or two people suffering, but all of these people right. who suffered for the cause of Christ. So, okay. So um, we're convincing each other here. We believe the resurrection. Yes. We know that you believe the resurrection. We want you to understand the weight that's behind it because somewhere along the line, this is how... False belief starts. This is how heresy yeah. starts. Somebody says, I don't think there was a resurrection. How could there be that? And, and to answer your opening question, if you take the resurrection out, then no, this is not a good religion. Right. There's nothing left. Right. This is not a good way of, of thinking or a, a good way of ordering your life. It's right. pointless. Yeah. Christianity is useless and, and profits nothing if there's no resurrection. Strong words. Paul's words, Yeah. right? We're about to get into that right now. So there, there's no such thing as uh, trying to separate it and let it stand on its own without a risen savior, right? right? right. 
Uh, verse 17, if Christ has not risen, then your faith um, is futile. Again, you are still, he says, he repeats that. The first part of verse 17 sounds like what he just said above. But verse, the, the rest of that, you are still in your sins. And um, I, I think we can, we can say that, that most all religious systems find some way to atone for sins or bad deeds or some negative component of their life. And he's just saying this, Christianity is built around the fact that my sins and your sins, our sins are atoned for by a resurrected Lord. If he doesn't come out of the grave, I've got no confidence that that, that sacrifice that was offered to God has been received. So he says, there's no resurrection, you're still in your sins. Yeah, yeah. every other religion that has any notion of atonement is you atoning for your own sins. That's right. You're, you're, you're working up to God, you're yeah. meeting God's standards maybe, or hopefully, right, right. but Christianity is unique because of that substitutionary death of Jesus. And so his reasoning here, if Jesus, well, we could back it up. If he didn't die, then who's still bearing the weight of sin? I am, right. and I'll have to answer for my sins to God someday. Yeah. Terrible thought. And, and then he goes, you know, not only crucifixion, but if Jesus didn't rise again, you're still in your sins because that would assume that God did not accept the sacrifice. Right. Jesus offered himself to the Father as propitiation, mm -hmm. a wrath appeasing sacrifice to, to uh, pacify God's anger, right? Yeah, yeah. And if he didn't rise again, that would be the Father's way of looking down and saying, nah, not good enough. Right. And, if, and if Jesus wasn't good enough and if, if his sacrifice wasn't accepted, then I'm in my sins and I'm going to have to do business with God, just me and him. No mediator, right. no substitute. No, no, you know, like think about Abel. He brings the, the blood to God knowing that I need something to die in my place. Now I've got nothing to offer him in my place. Right. I've got no one else to point to. So now I'm going to have to answer for my own righteousness. Right. That's how I'm going to stand. So think about that. If you're having a hard time saying the resurrection could be true, try standing before God to find justification if there's been no acceptable sacrifice offered on your behalf. No hope. No hope. Look at, um, how about verse 18 again, where he says, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And now he's talking about death, life after death. And he, he, you notice he, he combines that phrase, we're talking about the, 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 the um, Christian phrase of falling asleep. That's what the Bible uses. Uh, I think you, you were talking about yeah. that, right? Yeah. Um, and it is a beautiful picture. Meaning like this, this person, they're, they're, they're deceased, but they haven't ceased to exist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're still, they're, they're alive. They're, they're sleeping, waiting for their new body uh, and for Christ to come back again. And this is saying this, then if, if, if those who have fallen asleep in Christ, they, they've actually perished if there's no resurrection. They're, they're done. There's no future hope. Uh, think about that. No future hope. Christianity is about a future hope. Yeah. Um, it it, it uh, is what we're encouraged with individually. Yeah. Like, man, you're going to heaven. I'm going to go to heaven. But then also collectively, what's part of our great joy? Man, I, I'm going to get to see people that have gone to see the Lord before me. What a joy. I'm going to be together with brothers and sisters in Christ, people I've worshipped alongside of or pastored or been neighbors to and family members with. How does that not move you? When you think about someone you love dearly who has, who has passed on mm -hmm. in faith, Someone who's lying in a grave somewhere right now, they died in faith. How does it not move you to think you will see them again? Yeah. They died, but they're not dead. Right. And to know that there's a day coming when you will be reunited with them. I mean, right. if that doesn't move you, I don't think anything else really will, right. that, that prospect. And Paul makes it clear if there's, there's a couple different levels, right? If there's no general resurrection, if there's no resurrection at all, if that's not a thing, mm -hmm. then Christ didn't rise. Right. And if Christ didn't rise, then you're not, you're not going to rise because you're still in your sins. And if you're not going to rise, then also remember all those you love, they're not going to rise either. Right. There's just, I mean, it's a finality now. Death is the end, right. period. There's no, there's no expectation. Yeah. Everything is lost. Mm. Everyone is lost. Those, not only Christ, you and those you love, those who have gone on before us. And so you can uh, contrast that. I'm getting excited here, sorry. <laughs> you can contrast that with 1 Thessalonians 4, where Paul says not to mourn like those who have no hope. Mm. Well, if there's no resurrection, then those words carry no, no weight. Mm. You should mourn right. in hopelessness. Right. I mean, that's just even sad to say. Right. If there's no life after death, if, there's, if Christ didn't rise again from the dead, 
then when you stand at the graveside of someone you love who died in Christ, yeah, yeah that's goodbye forever yeah. without Christ's resurrection. It, it shows the danger, doesn't it, of us, of someone determining, oh, I don't like this portion of the scripture, so I'm just going to cut that yeah. out. Like, here's the gospel, but I don't know about this resurrection part. We can just do without it. But when you try to do without it, you do damage to the rest of the scripture. So the church at Thessalonica you were just talking about, he commends them in chapter 1 because they turn from idols to serve the living God. Their reputation's gone out. And also how they're waiting for Jesus' appearing. Yeah. So why wait for Jesus' appearing if there's no resurrection? Yeah. Jesus didn't raise. You're not going to raise. We're not going to raise. So, so why? You, you, just, you just undo <laughs> the fabric of Christianity. You, you, you know, this is not... This is not one of those just sort of marginal issues, a gray issue, we're not exactly sure. You know, this is made so clear for us in Scripture. And, and you're right, you just do away with, you gut the Christian hope. In fact, verse 19, what does he say? If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So he says, you could have hope in this life. Yeah. But if that's all that we have, we're the most pitiable. Yeah. So why is it that Christians would be the most pitiable? We, we are uh, a group of people who are investing in the next life. Mm -hmm. And if we are faithful to the Bible and the way the Bible tells us to live, then we are sacrificing much in this life, yeah. knowing that there is a next life in which things will be set right and there will be rewards with our risen Lord and there will be joy on the other side of this suffering. So if there's no resurrection and I'm not coming up out of my grave, then I'm sacrificing, I'm denying myself all sorts of things throughout this life for nothing. Mm. Um, I, when I could be getting vengeance. I was just thinking that. Right? I vengeance could, is mine, says the Lord. When's that happening? In the, in the next life, right. not in this one. Right. But if there's no resurrection, then I never, there's never that balancing of the scales. Uh, I'm denying myself. I could be going out and living for pleasure and money, and I could be trying to increase my, my own little kingdom here and enjoy this brief existence while it lasts. But as a Christian, I'm sacrificing those things. I'm giving, not, you know, just in general, I'm saying as Christians, mm -hmm. this is the kind of life we live. We pour ourselves out like our Savior did. And if we don't rise again, then we're doing all that and we're foregoing all those opportunities for pleasure for nothing. Mm. We're giving up everything there is, this little life, and we're getting nothing out of it yeah. if there's no resurrection. Right. That's how Paul's, you know, that's his thinking here. Mm. We're the most pitiable people because we've, in a sense, given up on this life. Right. We've, we've set our hearts on the next life. Right. And if there's not a next life, then you lose. And if, and if we are most pitiable, what does that make the Lord Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason that we are doing those, the reasons we are called to endure suffering and fight the good fight is because that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Yeah. So if we're to be pitied, if it's ridiculous for us to do that, then what does that say about our Lord? Because he did those things and he spoke about, of course, we didn't even touch on this, but he spoke about his own resurrection. So he's alive. Yeah. So if he spoke about his own resurrection <laughs> and he endured what he suffered so that then he would be raised to glory and he underwent all of the, um, not, not simply being misunderstood, but coming to his own who rejected him and then, you know, crucified him because of the glory that was going to be his with his father, right? Mm -hmm. He despised uh, the shame of the cross, knowing he was going to be seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. Yeah. If there's no right hand of the majesty on high, then Christ just endured all that for nothing. Yeah. So he would be the most, capital M, capital P, pitiable, and we're all underneath of you know, him as, as to be pitiable. It reminds me of C.S. Lewis's liar, lunatic, or telling the truth. Yeah, the Lord. That's one, you yeah. really, the only three ways you can handle Christ. Yeah. And to go all the way back full circle here, is there any Christianity worth following without a resurrection? No, because the founder of Christianity spoke about his rising again. Yeah. And if he was wrong, then, then he missed it. Then his, the, why, why listen to anything he says? Right. I mean, he told his disciples, right? He told them, uh, you think about in John's gospel, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. Yeah. And you also think about when he's sitting down with them at the Last Supper and he says, I won't taste of this again until the day I taste it in the kingdom, right? He's, he's yeah. talking about the next life. Right. So um, if, if Jesus was wrong about his own predictions that he would rise again, then why should I believe him when he says something about marriage or right. uh, money or you know, anything else? 
So, yeah, his own claims. That he believed in yeah. his own resurrection, right. and he proclaimed it. Yeah. So this is all part and parcel with his message. Right? So there's people who try to say, well, he was a good moral teacher. Well, you just take that and you turn it on its head, and he can't be a good moral teacher if in all of his teaching he said he was going to raise from the dead, yeah. and he never really did. Right. Then, right, we can't trust him. He either was out of his mind, didn't know what he was saying, or he straight out lied. Um, what, what, what's verse 32 say there in chapter, six, uh, chapter 15, I mean? <clears throat> um, he says, If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Yeah. It's, it's, it's along the same lines as verse uh, 19. If this, is, if this life is it, then instead of denying ourselves... We ought to be going out, what, what, what do we say, hedonists, yeah. living for pleasure. Yeah. And that's it. Um, <clears throat> just, just go out and get what you can while you can, yeah. because in a, in a few short years or a few short moments, you'll be dead and, and gone, and there's nothing, nothing beyond that. Right. Um, right. Maybe just as a, a word of encouragement, he's kind of arguing in the negative here. If Christ didn't rise, then you're still in your sins. And yeah. if you're still in your sins, and it's really like, right. wow, this is weighty. Then contrast that with the truth that he did rise. Right. That he did fulfill all righteousness for us. That he was accepted by the Father. And so to reverse all this, now we have everything That's to right. inherit. That's right. We have everything to look forward to. So if he didn't rise, as much as you have nothing to look forward to, now you flip that around to what the Bible proclaims. He actually did rise, yeah. and you have everything to gain by belonging yeah. to him. Yeah. And you have everything to hope for when you stand by a Christian's grave. And you have every right to expect joy and gladness and yeah. hope after yeah. death because as he rises, we rise with him, yeah. right? So yeah. just such a good, just a good yeah. contrast there, yeah. right? I think it'd be good, then, then let's close thinking about these things. Brothers and sisters, because Christ is risen, um, the preaching of the gospel is not in vain. Yeah. Preaching the word of God, clinging to the word of God, opening the Bible up in the morning when you do or in the evening or any time through the day and reading the scripture and hiding in your heart, it's not futile, it's not empty. What does he say at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Because death and the sting of death um, has been broken, really Jesus broke the teeth of death, he mm -hmm. killed death. Then, then all of your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Yeah. Be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. When you read the scriptures, even privately, that's a good thing. Um, that's, that's not an empty thing because Christ has risen from the dead. Amen. Your witness, your testimony uh, to other people about Christ is, is, not, um, is not an empty task. It's not a futile task. Yeah. Your sins really are forgiven because of Christ. Amen. What are we saying? You know, and I... I Bear them no more, praise yeah. the Lord. I don't bear my sins. Um, I'm not anymore. in my sins. That's right. If I to reverse it again. Exactly. He I'm did, not. so I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, he rose, so I'm, I'm not in my sins. My sins really have been atoned for. There really is a future hope. We've got ahead of us uh, life forever with Christ. As yeah. sure as he's risen from the dead. And the promise that's made to him, and of course Psalm 1611 is that... that that uh, you will not allow your Holy One what, to, to see Sheol. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Yeah. We're going to go be with this Lord. Um, you are not, living for Christ is actually not, in God's economy, pitiable. Amen. It's the wisest thing you could do. So we said uh, the, uh, the Elliot quote. Yeah, right here, the, the Jim Elliot quote, right? Please, no, go, go for it. And, and, and any of the kids watching this, you know, Miss Grace has got her lessons. Yeah that she's doing about Jim Elliott and Nate Saint and Peter, what was it, Fleming and Roger Udarian. There was five of them who went down to Ecuador, the Alca Indians. And, and people were looking at a guy like Jim Elliott saying, you're, you're, you're basically wasting your life yeah. to go down there and do this. And you're going to die. These are vicious and violent people. And um, I believe this is the 1950s. And Jim Elliott's quote, when, and, and or what he said was, has been quoted quite a bit since then. He says, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You, you make no mistake about it, you will not keep your physical life. We know that. It goes without, that's, that's one of the certainties of this life is the reality of death. You can't keep it. But you, in Christ, gain something that you can never lose. Yeah. And that's, that's eternal life. That's the hope of the resurrection. That's a resurrected, glorified life. 
And, and, and you know what? Jim Elliott said that, and uh, I don't know how much longer it was, but then his life was taken. He was martyred. He was, he was killed for the cause of Christ. He was young. He was a young man. Yeah, he was young. And, um, and yet he, right now, because the resurrection is true, he awaits a future resurrection of his glorified body, even as he is absent from that physical body and present with the Lord, according to 2 Corinthians 5. Yeah. So the hope of the resurrection should um, inspire us and move us to sacrifice for Christ, to live for Christ. Yeah, if, there, if there's no life after this, then um, a, a man like that gave up everything for right. nothing. Right. He gave up everything, which is this life, and he gets nothing. But the biblical testimony is that, relatively speaking, what he gave up was nothing mm -hmm. compared to what he's inheriting, which right. is everything. Yeah. So it's great. These are, it couldn't be more opposite here. Right. We're giving up so little to gain everything in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Some say back then in 1 Corinthians, back in the days of Corinth, some say there's no resurrection. People today will say there's no resurrection. Mm -hmm. The gospel is clear. The historical evidence of Christ's life, the histor historical evidence of his life and death and resurrection have been well established. Yeah. And the gospel uh, writers testify to it. The scriptures testify to it. Yeah. So again, we want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, we're a few days past Easter Sunday. We are a couple thousand years past the original day of Jesus' resurrection, the, his actual resurrection from the grave. But it's no less true and powerful for us today. Wherever you find yourself this evening, as a, as a brother or sister in Christ, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are settled into a living and lasting hope because of the resurrection of Christ. And we praise God for that. May you be encouraged by these words tonight. Will you pray for us? <clears throat> Lord, we give you praise and we worship you together tonight. Lord, I rejoice with my, my brothers and sisters in Christ to serve a risen Lord, a risen Savior. And I thank you that his sacrifice satisfied you. I thank you that we can come near and know you. Mm -hmm. And I give you praise tonight for the lamb that has taken away our sins. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I'm so glad that there's a life after this one. Please help us in these days and in these times to make eternal investments in that kingdom that will never fade away. Mm -hmm. Lord, help us to remember these things and not to lose heart. Sometimes it's so easy to get focused on what's happening right here, right now, and to forget that there is a hereafter. And I, I just pray that you would uh, remind us of these things in 1 Corinthians 15 and, and print them on our hearts. And I pray that we would encourage each other with these words. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.